Good evening. My name is Dr. Stephen Sanet. I'm an American osteopathic physician, and I'd like to talk to you tonight about Charlotte Weaver, an osteopath who was um, one of the pioneers of cranial osteopathy. Okay, this is tonight's lecture on Charlotte Weaver. She was a graduate of the American School of Osteopathy in 1912. She had some very different theories about cranial. She was not working with Dr. Sutherland. She was working independently on her own ideas. Through this lecture, I'm gonna give you some points from Dr. Sutherland, just so you may uh, have some comparisons between the two. She theorized that the cranium was composed of three specialized vertebrae. Um, and we'll get into that idea. She pioneered the idea that cranial motion was a stimulating or a regulating factor for the pituitary. She promoted the idea that patients could suffer lesions that could be manipulated within areas of dural duplication and intervertebral articulation. What she actually did, the techniques that she did, those are not known. She felt that these manipulations could be done before ossification of the cranium was complete. So that treatment would have had to take place to get the changes she was talking about before full ossification which happens between ages 18 to 25. Um, as we discuss her theories, it is important to note that there's a lot of arguments that she raises. Um, there's some views she has on embryology, which was uh, in conflict in the day when she thought them, and they're in conflict now with how we understand them. But I wanna give you the material as I've been able to find it. She did incorporate also a few um, heretical ideas that were heretical during her time. They're not accepted today, but this is what helped shape Charlotte Weaver and her research. Also, within her own statements and her own research, there are several inconsistencies with things that actually contradict themselves. So I'm gonna do my best to give you as much of a primary presentation of how she looked at the cranium. So regardless of the inconsistencies, her work was still a great contribution to the expanding idea of osteopathic uh, cranial osteopathy. Morphology, according to Dr. Weaver, she made vertebral analogs of the cranial anatomy. Um, and it's, it's kind of a far stretch for us to look at the vertebra and then superimpose that on cranial bones, but this is what she did. So the various parts of the, of that we would look at in the um, vertebral segment, the spinous process, articular process, lamina, and so forth. Everything that we're used to looking at, she tried to compare these two areas of cranial bones. Let's look at the occiput. The occiput at birth is in four pieces. You have the squama, two condylar, uh, two condylar sections, and a basilar section. So we have it in four parts at birth, but developing when it's normally developing from six ossification centers. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, six centers normally. So the basi occiput has one center. The exoccipital, which will be this, uh, what borders on the condylar part and below the nuchal ridge, this has two centers. The supraoccipital bone, which is behind, which is below the highest nuchal line here and the posterior margin of the foramen magnum behind the foramen magnum is here and the inner parietal bone there are two centers normally and that's above the nuchal ridge on both parietal bones according to dr weaver she makes these vertebral analogs the cranial anatomy as much as we can understand it what she's calling the centrum of the occipital bone that she is calling the third cranial vertebra that's what this is indicating here. She looks at this as the third cranial vertebra. This would be the centrum or the basi occiput. Here is what she's relating to the pedicles, transverse processes, spinous processes. So if you sort of superimpose a segment upon this and looked at this as the posterior aspect of the segment, here you'd have your transverse processes and here you would have what might be the body or anterior part. The second cranial vertebrae, as we are going up 
from what will be what would have been the notochord is the centrum hypochordal valve pedicles transverse process and so forth again she's going to superimpose all these onto uh, the sphenoid bone in this way that this would be the centrum or what might be the body and here you can see the pedicles here are the sphenoid turb turbinates i'm not asking you to accept this by the way i'm just asking you to understand how it is that she looked at things the first cranial vertebrae or uh, in her view is the dorsum cellae uh, the dorsum cellae she would consider to be the centrum. The hypochordal, the hypochordal bowel, okay, or would be the anterior part of that ver vertebra. She's looking at the nasal septum and starting to incorporate other facial bones, maxillary processes, ethmoid bones, frontals, and so forth. So she's incorporating other aspects actually outside of the dorsum cellae. Um, it is noteworthy to note that the notochord, which is where all these vertebral bodies and discs originate, extends into the dorsum cellae. This is why Dr. Weaver labeled the dorsum cellae as the first cranial vertebrae. And then if we start to go inferior, you would look at the sphenoid as the second, the occiput as the third cranial vertebrae. So she bases this on the embryology and developments of the somites. That's not really, uh, that's not anything that is, um, that we would disagree with embryologically today. There were discs, um, actual discs between the dorsum cellae and the um, basis sphenoid. And that disc um, ends up disappearing in adulthood. There's a disc between the basis sphenoid and the occiput, which um, also will become a synchondrosis. Uh, the last disc, since she's analogizing this to a vertebral segment, cranial segment one, cranial segment two, cranial segment three, that last disc, she's saying, is functionally the, the suspensory ligaments between the occiput and C1. So it's not actually a disc, but to keep this model intact, that's how she's looking at it. She's saying the function is like a disc. Let's talk about the nature of joints. All joints begin as movable structures in a preosseous matrix. If the connecting tissues is fibrous, the joint evolves into a suture. If it's cartilaginous, it becomes a synchondrosis. So we find sutures in bones that are formed in membrane, which are the cranial bones of the vault, because as the brain's gonna grow, the vault's gonna require a little bit more space. So that's the purpose of the sutures, to allow growth of the enclosed structures. Uh, I put it here, just a little footnote here. Sutherland believed that the sutures allowed for movement of the PRM, and that that was required. But again, um, don't be confused. Sutherland and Dr. Weaver were not working in tandem. They were not um, conferring with each other notes back and forth. They were just working in their own separate directions on what would become cranial osteopathy. Some definitions, intraparietal, preparietal, and sutural of Wormian. Intraparietal refers to the true intraparietal part of the occipital bone, which will be above the highest nuchal, uh, highest nuchal ridge which might be here, maybe we could consider it here. This is actually a bit far above, but this is really that area of interparietal. Preparietal would be uh, bones that are appearing as a consequence of occasional specific pair centers called pre-interparietal or bones that develop from their own ossification centers outside of the normal ossification centers. Sutural or wormian bones, these can usually be found uh, lambda Lambda is a common place for finding that, is a common place for development of sutural wormian, uh, wormian bones that might have their own ossification center. They don't change the essential cranial movement um, as we look at our theories according to Sutherland. The true intraparietal part of the occipital bone above the highest nuchal line forms from a variable number of ossification centers, which might arise in the membrane above the supraoccipital, or they could have been uh, pieces of membrane that got damaged and end up forming a separate ossification center. So here you can see in this x-ray here, this is, uh, get my arrow to come up here. This is one big wormian bone here, or os inca, as you will see on the next diagram. <laughs> 
So the intraparietal bones they called os incae, and here there's just a few um, variations on it. You can see several different bones that formed here, some rather large bones and a single bone here. This is the squamous part of the occipital bone uh, where different variations may, might happen, where it above the nuchal ridge and where it has the junction with the parietal bones. Um, Dr. Sullivan felt that these gave increased flexibility when he observed them. And again, it's not changing the essential motion of what we consider for the occipital bones, parietal bones, and so forth in our normal cranial models. Um, dural pathology. Within dural duplication, there's major areas of cranial pathology Dr. Weaver felt that occurred within the dura and specifically with dural duplication, um, which gave us our venous sinuses. And she felt it was particularly important following the cell liturgica, was important for neuroglandular problems. Cavernous sinus was important for venous, more important for venous problems. Frame and lacera are more important for arterial problems. Although we're going to see a mix of venous and arterial and neural problems in each of these categories. If we look at the cavernous sinus, um, we see a blood supply, a vast venous plexus here, contents. We do have the internal carotids and branches, carotid plexus of sympathetic nerves and effects to cranial uh, ocular motor nerve, trochlear uh, V2, uh, V1, V2 from trigeminal and the abducens nerve. Lesioning of the, ca of the cavernous sinus essentially uh, led to, according to Dr. Weaver, to two pathologies. Abnormal dural tensions, particularly in the area of dural duplication, or she looked at subluxations due to intracranial discs, which Dr. Weaver compares in contrast with spinal lesions or spinal subluxations. Again, what her particular treatment was for these things uh, that I'm not aware that anyone has written that down or that's been passed on. Framen lacerum or really lacerated frame and broken framen. Uh, this is the intervertebral framen between what Dr. Weaver refers to as the second and third cranial segments between occiput and uh, sphenoid. It's formed from sphenoid and it has a roof of the petrous temporal bone as well and the basal portion of the occipital bone. Clinical implications include the arterial supply, autonomic nerve supply, and to a lesser extent, uh, venous supply. So Dr. Equ uh, Dr. Um, Weaver equated lesioning of this foramen to that of a spinal subluxation, like we might have on a you know, type one or type two lesion of the spine which he describes between second and third cranial segments with an overhang of the petrous portion of the temporal bone. Uh, this is showing you here the path of the carotid artery through this bone. And here's the overhang that she talks about of the petrous bone. This is the foramen lacerum. Here's the overhanging part of the petrous, part of the temporal bone. She focused on basilar trauma. She felt that the internal carotid, especially um, if that was damaged, would compromise the prosencephalon and the mesencephalon, uh, the more advanced parts of our brain and the midbrain. She felt the rhombencephalon was less susceptible because its blood supply was coming from vertebral arteries. Uh, clinical pearl from Dr. Weaver. She related uh, the vertebra below because they provided only blood supply and not the internal carotid. Vertebral artery had direct branches, or anterior spinal artery, posterior inferior cerebellar artery, direct branches going to the rhombencephalon. Cellotersca, what I've done here is I've just outlined all of the hormones coming from the various parts of the cellotersca that we know in, in modern medicine. So the anterior pituitary uh, is giving you adrenocorticotropic hormone, growth hormones, luteinizing and follicle stimulating hormones, prolactin and thyroid stimulating hormone. The hypothalamus, which is gonna be stored in the posterior pituitary is your ADH, your vasopressin and your oxytocin. Intermediate pituitary is a melanocyte stimulating hormone. That's how we see it today in um, our, our current medical view.
the tympanum cellae or dural duplication, this is kind of a complicated uh, diagram. This is the basi sphenoid, basi occiput. This is the dorsum cellae here. There is a disc between here. There is a synchondrosis between here. The dura, this is DD, is a um, de-differentiated de dura. And then it becomes, uh, it meets with the tympanum cellae. It wraps around this infundibulum, which is where the, the pituitary is. Okay, and this dural capsule of the hypophysis. And then it meets with the presphenoid. The dural capsule, the hypothesis, and the periosteum come together and they adhere. They adhere at this point here and here. This is opposite the termination of the notochord. The dural motion of the tympanum, uh, tympanum cella is theorized to be the regulating and stimulating influence on the pituitary gland, according to Dr. Weaver. She felt that there was a cranial motion occurring here at the dorsum cella between the disc of the dorsum cellae and the basi sphenoid, and it was causing a stimulating action to the um, area underneath the infundibulum. 